Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. We are done with another year and it's time to unbox the uh, micro FRQs. I've got set one that I'm gonna do right now. As soon as I'm done with set two, I'll post it as well. Uh, it's been a good year. I appreciate everybody uh, watching uh, ReviewEcon.com's uh, YouTube videos and going to the website and playing the games and buying the review booklets. Uh, I appreciate all that. Uh, so before we get started, I wanted to remind you that if you uh, have felt like this uh, uh, channel is valuable, let next year's students know about it. I still encourage you to like and subscribe to help me out with that algorithm as well. Uh, before we get into the content, I want to uh, remind you that I don't know what the rubrics are going to say for sure. These are my best guesses regarding what I think the answers are going to be. Let me know in the comments what you think, if you think I'm right. Um, I have missed rubric points in the past. Uh, sometimes my, explain, uh, my explanations don't quite hit the rubric and uh, that's, that's going to happen. Even the best students are going to miss a point here and there. Perfect scores are extremely rare. Uh, but So let's get into it. These, these are the uh, answers that I think are most likely to show up on the rubric but we won't know until after the summer when we actually get those rubrics released. So here we go, here's question number one. Again, this is, uh, this is set one. So we start off with Soja Farm uh, is a typical profit maximizing firm that produces and sells soybeans in a constant cost, perfectly competitive market, and they are in long run equilibrium. The market price of soybeans is $14 per bushel. We're gonna start off by drawing and labeling side-by-side -side graphs for the market, soybean market, and for Soja Farm. And we're gonna have each of those things listed that we got there as well. So here's my answer to this first part. We can see that I have the uh, market equilibrium price marked as $14, downward sloping demand, upward sloping supply. The market quantity is marked as QM. The market price equals the firm price and that becomes the marginal revenue, demand, average revenue and price or Mr. DARP. We have an MC curve at the intersection of marginal cost and marginal revenue. We find our profit maximizing quantity labeled QF and the average total cost curve will be labeled AT or the end. The average total cost curve will be both at its minimum when it intersects that marginal cost curve and it will be tangent to the uh, MR equals M uh, to the demand curve at MR, MR equals MC. And that indicates that they are breaking even. This, that, that means they are at long run equilibrium. All right, so I think I hit all of those points up there for one, two, and three. Let's move on to the next part. So uh, they have a question for us. If Soja Farm is the only firm in the market that chooses to increase its price of soybeans to $15 per bushel, will Soja Farm's total revenue increase by a dollar, remain the same, or decrease to zero? Explain. Well, remember that perfectly competitive firms are price takers. That means that they are stuck with the market price. So here's my answer, it's decrease because, that's the explain point here, Soja Farm is a price taker and has a perfectly elastic demand curve, so they will sell zero units, or zero units if I can speak, uh, if they sell above the market price. I don't know exactly what the rubric's gonna say, I think price taker might be enough, but, or maybe saying that they have an elastic demand curve, uh, some people might want to talk about substitutes. I don't know if that'll hit the rubric or not, but that's my answer. All right, moving on to the next part. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to, uh, we have a change in the scenario. Soybeans are now going to be an input uh, in the production of tofu and tofu becomes a popular food option among consumers. Since uh, uh, more people are eating tofu, we're going to have a increase in the demand for soybeans because that's a derived demand, it's an input. So we're going to be increasing the demand for soybeans, shifting it to the right, that increases the price in the market to P2. I've got that P2 labeled, also an increase in the quantity in the market as well. That gives us a new price. I went ahead and labeled it PF2 and that becomes a new higher marginal revenue, demand, average revenue and price and gives us a new higher uh, profit maximizing quantity that I'm labeling there, Q star, just like what the question requires. And there we go, and now we have economic profits, by the way. Moving on to the next part, part D. Given the increase in the popularity of tofu in part C, what will happen to the number of firms in the soybean market in the long run? Remember, I've got economic profits now. By the way, I think we could have a consistency point here. We'll see what happens at the rubric. Um, but uh, what's gonna happen, since we have economic profits, there's going to be an increase in the number of firms because, that's the explain point, Soja Farm now has economic profits and there are low barriers to entry. Those profits incentivize firms to enter the market. Just saying profits might be enough, but I'm not sure. I always err on the side of explaining a little more to make sure I hit the rubric. 
All right, on to the next part. Suppose a 25% increase in the market price for of quinoa causes uh, a 5% decrease in the quantity demanded of quinoa and a 10% increase in the quantity of tofu. Is the demand for quinoa elastic, inelastic, or unit elastic? Explain using numbers. Now this is price elasticity of demand, and we're going to, for, to explain this using numbers, I'm gonna do a calculation of the elasticity coefficient. Uh, so once I calculate that coefficient, I've got my answer, and I got the calculation there in my explanation as well to make sure I'm using the numbers they're wanting. Uh, it's inelastic because the elasticity coefficient is negative 0.2, uh, and then I have the calculation there. I don't think they'll require the calculation, and that is an absolute value less than one. Uh, less than one. So uh, I think they will also accept it if you left it positive, but I but I'm not sure about that. So because I know sometimes people express uh, demand coefficients, uh, price elasticity coefficients as a positive number, but technically they're negative since it's the inverse relationship between price and quantity. Here we go. Calculate the pro cross price elasticity of demand between quinoa and tofu. And now we're going to show our work. So remember, quantity is always on top. We're looking at the quantity change for percentage change in the quantity of demanded for one good, this is tofu, compared to the price increase of the other good. So it's a 25% change in quantity for tofu divided by 25% change in the demand for, uh, in the price of quinoa. And that gives us a elasticity, co elasticity coefficient of 0.4. All right, on to the next part. Next question, good X is produced and sold in a perfectly competitive market. The gra provided graph shows the market for good X. All right, so that is, uh, as we can see, it is a positive externality in consumption because the marginal social benefit is greater than the marginal private benefit. The marginal private benefit is our demand curve. Marginal private cost curve is the supply curve. All right, identifying that uh, equilibrium quantity, just find the intersection between the marginal private benefit and marginal private cost, and that gives us uh, 300 is our units of, uh, our, is our quantity, and that is at a price of $15. On to the next part. Now we're gonna calculate the dead weight loss at the market equilibrium quantity. And again, I think we can have a consistency point if you identified the incorrect quantity, uh, as long as you calculate the dead weight loss at that quantity correctly. There is our dead weight loss triangle there. We're going to calculate the area of that. The reason we, that is the triangle is because it points to the allocatively efficient quantity of 400. It's also the uh, at the quantity we're getting of 300. That's the uh, marginal cost of our quantity, the marginal benefit of our quantity. Those are the two points of the triangle. And then the third point of the triangle is where marginal cost equals marginal benefit, social, that is marginal cost and marginal benefit. All right, moving on, there's our calculation. It is essentially the area of that triangle. Uh, I think if you just did 100 times 10 times one half, that'll probably be enough. But the answer is $500 and you gotta show your work. Here we go, on to part C. Uh, suppose that the government wants to eliminate deadweight loss in the market for good X. Which of the following will achieve the government's objective, a per unit tax on consumers or a per unit subsidy on consumers? And now we're going to explain. Remember, you can actually tax or subsidize either consumers or producers, and whichever curve is getting that per unit tax or subsidy, that curve will shift. So in this case, it's for consumers, so we're gonna be moving that private benefit curve. And here's the answer, it's a per unit subsidy, a tax would actually increase dead weight loss because it will shift the marginal private benefit to the marginal social benefit. And that's going to bring the equilibrium quantity to the socially optimal quantity of 400. That's assuming that they get the uh, subsidy, the per unit subsidy, exactly correct. And the next question deals with what the dollar amount of that per unit tax or subsidy should be. And it's going to be the vertical distance between the marginal social benefit and that marginal private benefit. So there's that distance between, vertical distance between the two curves. That, as you can see, is from 20 to 10. And that means the difference between the two is $10. Just identify it, no work necessary. Over to part D. Suppose instead the government imposes a price ceiling uh, of $10. Will that price ceiling achieve the socially optimal quantity of good X? And we're gonna explain again. Uh, and here's my answer. Oh, by the way, before we get to that, uh, you can see that uh, the, the allocatively efficient quantity is 400 and at the price of $10, that is the quantity demanded. But we're not actually going to get that quantity. That might be what consumers want to buy, but at the price of $10, 
only 200 units are actually going to be produced. And you can't buy more than the suppliers are willing to produce. It's always going to be the smaller of the two quantities that are actually exchanged or traded and or purchased. So I put no is my answer because this also calls for an explain point. Uh, it will e because it will decrease the quantity exchange from 300 to 200 and increase dead weight loss as it is further from the socially optimal quantity of 400. All right, on to the third question. And this one's a little bit tricky. There's a interesting part to it. We'll see how everybody did. Uh, so what is, a, this is a regular old payoff matrix. Uh, we've got field cruiser. They're trying to increase reliability or increase power of their cars. And then we have nice ride that's looking to increase safety or comfort. And we've got the profit in these boxes that show uh, the, uh, out, the profit they will get if they end up in that quadrant as far as their outcome goes. So the question is for A, what is Field Cruiser's most profitable strategy if Nice Ride chooses to improve safety? That means we are looking at that row right there for Nice Ride improving safety, and Field Cruiser is actually choosing between $28 million of profit and $35 million of profit. Clearly, $35 million of profit is better, and so we're just gonna say improve power. I think power will be enough, by the way. All right, on, and I put a little star there, so I remember that is the uh, best choice there for Field Cruiser. On to the next question. Does Nice Ride have a dominant strategy? Explain using numbers from the payoff. Let's take a look. First, Nice Ride, if, uh, if Field Cruiser uh, chooses to improve reliability, then Nice Ride is going to be choosing between $10 million and $30 million of profit. Clearly, $30 million is better. But if Field Cruiser is looking at improving power, now Nice Ride is choosing between $32 million and $25 million. And now they're going to, instead of choosing comfort, they're going to choose safety instead. So here's our answer in the end, no, right? They, it, depending on what Field Cruiser does, Nice Ride might choose to do uh, improve, improve comfort. Otherwise they might choose to improve uh, safety. So since they have, uh, since, they, uh, since it's dependent on on what uh, Field Cruiser does, they do not have a dominant strategy. So the answer here is no, because one more time, we've got an explain point, And again, we have to use numbers here. I like to just use inequalities. $30 or $30 million is greater than 10 million and 32 million is greater than 25 million. I forgot a dollar sign there, but you're, you're good with that, All right? And I don't think they'll require the units. All right, there we go. So I'm just showing what, the, these are the numbers from the choices that we just looked at, All right? On to the next part, is Nice Ride choosing to improve safety and Field Cruiser choosing to improve power a Nash equilibrium? Now, interestingly, this payoff matrix actually has two Nash equilibria, two of them, right? But you don't really need to know that in order to answer this question. Just take a look at that upper uh, right quadrant there where uh, Nice Ride is choosing safety and uh, Field Cruiser is choosing power. From there, if Field Cruiser changes their mind and tries to unilaterally change their decision and move over to re reliability, they actually lose money. They move from 37, 35, or $35 million to $28 million, and they're worse off. Uh, at the same time, if, if Nice Ride switches from 32 million, from safety of $32 million in profit down to comfort for $25 million of profit, they also are worse off. Since neither uh, group, since neither entity has an incentive to move or change, this is a Nash equilibrium. The definition of a Nash equilibrium is if it's an outcome where neither party has an incentive to change uh, their strategy, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and explain that and use numbers explaining it as it says I should. Yes, because if either firm changes strategies, that outcome, uh, from that outcome, they will earn less profit. Nice Ride will earn 25 million instead of 32, and Field Cruiser will earn 28 instead of 35. All right, and I forgot some millions in there, but I think you're fine, <laughs> right? Uh, I was quick, pretty quick on trying to make these answers for us. On to the next part. For part D, suppose Nice Ride and Field Cruiser decide to merge uh, to maximize combined profits and choose to keep producing both Nice Ride and Field, Field Cruiser vehicles. Assuming the values in the payoff matrix do not change, what it, uh, will it be the firm, new firm's total profit? All right? For this, this is essentially asking what's the monopoly outcome? How do you find the monopoly outcome? Well, you just combine the profits in the 
four quadrants we have and you figure out which quadrant has the highest combined profit. That happens to be the lower left quadrant there and you combine those dollar values. That's the most profit these two entities combined can produce or can make and that is $70 million. Just add them up. On to the next part, part E. Suppose that a change in fuel prices reduces the profitability of choosing to improve power by $10 million for field cruiser. Identify each firm's profit at the Nash equilibrium. Now we are only going to be looking at uh, field cruiser. They're the only ones that are impacted by this change as far as their profit potential goes. So I'm just gonna change the numbers there, reducing them by 10 million for the, for the decision of field cruiser making uh, uh, improving power. So, we redu uh, so now it's 25 million and 10 million. Are, are what they're gonna earn in that column. So now it's asking us to identify the Nash Equilibrium. Once you go ahead and solve the Nash Equilibrium after this change, those are where we're gonna be. Those are the, the stars are on the decisions that are most profitable. And uh, it turns out that now the monopoly outcome is the Nash Equilibrium. By the way, the monopoly outcome was one of the previous Nash Equilibria, but, and it was the other one was the upper right corner. So uh, there we go, I'm just gonna identify it, nice ride. They're earning $30 million in that lower left quadrant and uh, Field Cruiser is earning 40 million. All right, there we go. And there's my best guess answers. Let me know in the comments what you think about my answers. Um, I'm gonna be pretty busy over the next uh, few days. We got Mother's Day on the weekend and, uh, and the new exam, uh, the macro exam questions are gonna be coming out and I'll be trying to make some videos for those as well. Uh, so. So uh, I might not be able to answer as many questions regarding these, uh, but please let me know what you think. I'll at least try to heart and, and like your comments. Uh, also, let me know how you think you did. Make, make a guess on how you think you did on these. Um, we won't again know the uh, rubric, uh, official rubric until uh, maybe September or October, depending on when they come out. Uh, again, thank you very much for supporting ReviewEcon.com. It's been a great year. I really appreciate it. Let your friends know about it, uh, about ReviewEcon.com as they're coming through AP Economics. And I appreciate it. Take care, everybody. See you next time.